Hi, I wanted to show you what was the Gestapo headquarters at 145 Via Tasso. It's right in the center of Rome. It's about, it's east of the Colosseum. You could walk it, I have. That's what I'm doing. And um, it's really, this is where, when the Nazis occupied Rome in September 43, they started arresting partisans, Jews, political prisons, police, soldiers, and they took them to this home uh, for interrogation, for torture, for beatings. Many were taken and killed, some were killed here. And I take you on a tour through this later, but I wanted you to see more interestingly what this neighborhood is like because it's not set off like you would expect a prison where such horrible goings on are gonna happen. It's in the middle of a Roman street. Here we go, there's a, there's a school next door. Do you hear the kids? Listen, right? There are apartments across the street, all down the street. It's just in the middle of Rome. This was Gestapo headquarters and horrible things happened here and you read about them in the book. But I wanted you to see modern day, what it looked like because it's so unique and you wouldn't really have ever believed that you could have basically a house of horror um, in the middle of a city. There were 15, 20 or so cells, and I'll show you pictures later, but the walls were all bricked in and the windows were closed. Otherwise it was four floors of apartments that were converted to torture cells and imprisonment cells, several solitary confinement. So let me just begin with one two minute thing about Italian history, because you just saw this really sad thing, which was a Gestapo headquarters in the heart of Rome. And there it is in all its mundane evil, looking just like a row house on a beautiful street, but it's really what I said in the video. It's just a place where people were imprisoned, Jews, anti-fascists, anybody that the Nazis wanted to round up. Now, real quick, I just want to explain to you what was going on in Italy at the time, because in a way it mirrors what I want to talk about. There was real confusion at this stage of the war. Italy, what happened is that Italy was losing and losing badly. As you know, they had taken the side of the Nazis, so they were fighting with Germany. And this is at the very end of all the fascists. I mean, we've talked in previous videos about how the fascists enacted all these anti-Semitic laws. Fascism in Italy, which was where it was born, did not begin as anti-Semitic. And it's very interesting in this book and in the history of it, because Rome is the site of the oldest continuously existing Jewish civilization outside of the Middle, in Western civilization. So it's really an important place to look at. So anyway, um, here's Italy, it's fighting with the Nazis, he joins with Hitler, Mussolini joins with Hitler, and Italy starts to lose and lose badly. Because part of the Allies' kind of battle plan was to pound Italy. And Italy was misled by Mussolini, didn't expect to lose, didn't expect to have these terrible bombing campaign. Italy is bombed mercilessly. There is death, there is destruction, there is starvation. And Italians start to get angry at Mussolini and they blame him and they decide that's it. We are surrendering. We, we surrender. Now that's the part you've heard about and you've read about that. But what's interesting is Italy doesn't sign the armistice right away. In a way, it's trying to decide to negotiate the armistice, try to get the best terms. And what happens is because the government that was left behind this Badoglio fellow, who you'll read about in Eternal, um, because he kind of dithers, Italy gets bombed by both sides. So there is a point in time when Italy is bombed by the Americans and also by the Nazis. Both of them are saying, you are gonna come with us, we're gonna make you pay, we're furious at you. Interesting fun flat fact is that Clark Gable was one of the Americans who bombed Italy during this time. So was somebody else, but I'll tell you about him in a minute. And so what happens is it's a very, very confusing time when Italy finally decides to side with the Allies. The Nazis are furious and they had been poised outside of Rome all this time because Rome was the prize and they're waiting to pounce and they invade and they take it over and they establish martial law. And I'm not going to tell you anymore because you're reading the book. Here's the behind the book part. I'm a little girl growing up. I am in Norwood, Pennsylvania, Delaware County. I have a brother and a mom, and I'm very close to my dad. Here's a picture of my father, Frank Scottolini. 
This is at my law school graduation. He was a great guy, and we're going to talk about him a little bit. And I'll explain why that matters to you. We were super close. And, you know, we talked about a lot of things and almost everything. And I remember saying to him, Dad, what did you do in the war? You know, because those of us who have parents who serve or cousins who serve or husbands who serve, you know, you ask that question. And he said, well, I, he was in the Army Air Force, which is actually a thing that doesn't exist anymore, but existed then. And I said, well, what did you do? And I don't even know how old I was when I asked him, but I wasn't very old. Not like now when I'm very old. And he said, I was a radio guy on airplanes. And at some point I said, well, what kind of airplanes? And it came out that it was bombers. Like, so I said, well, wh what did you bomb? And basically he said, well, we flew over Italy. So I would love to give you more of an answer about that. But that's part of what's interesting about tonight because there are so many questions I wish I asked him, especially when I sat down to write Eternal and understand the effects of the bombing campaign in Italy. And also the fact that my father was probably flying above on behalf of the United States, bombing Italy. And by the way, as you know, from my nose, which is very large, my mother always said we get more oxygen than anyone in the room, that we're Italian American. And I remember thinking this must have been strange because we have, my brother had sisters who were born in Italy. I'll show you a picture. This is a picture of my grandmother. Look how old this is. I know you get those ring lights. There's nothing I can do about it. My grandfather, my grandmother, and my Aunt Rose. This is like 1920 or something like that, I think. So then what happens is, picture my, grand, my father flying over Italy, bombing a country where his ancestors are from on behalf of his new country, which he loves. Now, here's another wrinkle. When you start talking about this confusion in war, this doubling, this what is really going on, you know, they talk about the fog of war. It's interesting how it affects families, and in particular, mine. Because while my father was serving, fighting for the United States, defending his country, my grandmother, here's a picture, by the way, of my grandmother and my father. They were super close. My father was the youngest, the only boy of three daughters. The youngest and the only boy. So you know what he was. He was the prince. And he loved it. And also he was very good looking, as you can see. So as he always said, his feet didn't touch the ground the first six years of his life. And by that he meant they carried him around. They loved him. They adored him. Frank, I'm sure they did. Um, so what is interesting about that vis-a-vis -vis my family history is that my grandmother came here from Italy with my grandfather in the picture. They never became citizens of the United States because they couldn't speak. My, they spoke no English. They spoke only Italian. And my grandfather was even illiterate. So there was a time when during the World War II in which my father was serving the United States and bombing Italy, there was a law enacted. It was the same law that said the Japanese, uh, Japanese Americans, Japanese people have to be interned. It also applied to Germans and it applied to Italians. And what had to happen is that Italians had to, and Italian Americans had to med register as enemy aliens. My grandmother and grandfather registered as enemy aliens. I wrote a whole book about it. Well, it inspired another book called Killer Smile. Here's their pictures. Can you see my little grandmom? That's her, Maria, right? That's her looking felonious, though she wasn't. This is her picture before. It's a very interesting thing. What happens to war? How war affects families? How it affected my own? And the more, and what's really interesting about that fact, I didn't even know about that fact that my grandparents registered as enemy aliens, even though they loved this country, even though they lived in, in West Philadelphia their whole lives and loved it with an immigrant's fervor. They were believed in its promise and, their, and its promise came through for them. My father went to college on the GI Bill, the first in our family to go to college, thanks to the government. And then I come along later and I get to be a writer thanks to the public education system and public libraries because this is an amazing country. But what's interesting is when I think about my relationship to my father and the questions I thought I wish I had asked him, we talked about everything, but we never talked about 
what he did in the war or how he felt about what he did in the war and if it conflicted him at all, because we still have relatives in Italy. And he visited them with my brother, another regret of mine, because they said, do you want to go? And I was on deadline. I go, no, I can't go. And then sadly, my father passed a few years after that. And so what I want to try to say is first, it's very interesting because the thing my father told me when he told me about the enemy alien registrations card, he told me when he knew that he had blood cancer and that it might be fatal. And it's the first time in my life that he had told me that about my grandparents. I couldn't even believe it. It was so crazy that anybody thought they were enemies of this country because they never left the kitchen. Um, but it's significant now looking back that that was what he told me. Like he thought he was going to die, and it was the thing that he wanted me to know. And I, I'm saying this now because I think it's very interesting to talk about historical fiction. And when I do that, I'm coming out every week, and we talk about books, and we're going to do that tonight too. Um, it sounds like history sounds dry, and it might even sound boring. And if you learned it like I did, it's 1862, this happened, this happened. You learned memorized dates. But what I learned in writing this book and in the previous books, but really this one is kind of the culmination of it, is that history is really the story of families. Eternal is the story. I've told you it's a love triangle. Elisabetta and two gorgeous guys, which one will she choose? But really, it's also the story of their families. And it's the story of my family. It's my grandmother. Right? It's my grandmother, wherever she is. Here she is with my dad. It's our story too. We are impacted by World War II. We are still impacted by World War II. And that's what I want you to understand that I think even when you're writing about historical fiction, you're still telling a story about a family. And when you think about history as the story of families built on each other generation over generation, maybe in your own family, think about your own family. It makes you think about it differently. And think about the stuff like, let me just say to you, I wish I had asked my dad those questions. I do not know now. You know, nowadays, he might have posted about it. But he would have buddies. They would all throw their pictures up. But those stories are lost now. I can't even find a picture of him in uniform. And so I guess what I'm saying to you is, your family has those stories. I know it. And it doesn't have to be about a war. It could just be about what happened to Aunt Lydia. And what, what about this one? And gee, how did they break their... You know, all this stuff, how did this certain thing happen? Figure out if they told you. Figure out if you know. Figure out if they told you the truth. All of those stories, the stories of your family, make your personal history. And your personal history makes the story of a country, or maybe several countries, of a, of a world, of a time period in a world that in my family can extend from 1890-something, when my grandmother was born, to even today, where I'm talking into a phone, to people who can actually, listen, look at the wonderful comments. My grandmother from Poland. Right, no matter where, you have a family story. I wanted to introduce my daughter now, and we'll bring her back later for the silly stuff, but you're right. The, Donna, these stories are so important. Here's my daughter, Francesca. <laughs> and she knew my father. Of course, she of loved course. my father. Here's a picture of her with my dad. Yeah. This is at my second wedding. <laughs> that is a friggin' disaster, and we're not going to talk it about that. It was a nice wedding. It, yeah. Whoa, Hurricane oh, Fran. I made a big mistake. I should have said, I don't, I don't. But, <laughs> um, but I did, and thank God I stopped. But let's talk about Pop, because he's really the best. There I thought he is, it was looking so interesting that you said... He told, he only told you that about his mother and parents on, you know, when, after diagnosed with a terminal illness, you said that he, that's the one thing he wanted to tell you so badly. But I think it's interesting that he didn't tell you until then. Like, I think for so many more years, he didn't want to tell you. Right. I wonder if it's such a, you know, I think that was a really a, a dark period in, in our own history and a, a dark policy. It was a betrayal that, to treat naturalized, you know, citizen immigrants who had gone through citizenship and everything like they were enemies well, while he's serving, right? I mean, do you think he felt that shame? I, I think they, I know they did. I know they did. I know they felt kind of falsely yeah. accused. But the truth is, and that's what's so interesting about, you know, what happens to law in wartime that we become, Stand. it's always that tension between security and civil liberties and how do we balance those things, stay safe, but still protect, but still be able to express ourselves and not trample on each other. But I, but I yeah. think that's a good point about Pop. Yeah, and it's sadly, my point is, we won't know the answer. But I'm going to think yeah. about but that. But it is so different from what I remember of him because he was so 
otherwise so open, just in every possible way, so open-hearted, so open-minded. He was such a, just a warm, effusive, enthusiastic person about everything. And he just was, I mean, I, of course I only knew him as a grandfather, as an older man, but he never felt like an old man because he was so curious about everything and always learning. And it was never like, oh, these newfangled things. Yeah. Oh my God, it was the opposite. He was relentlessly we should, modern. We should tell them really oh, quick sorry. that story. What? No, let's tell them that story really quick about him. I can't get on the thing. Yeah. I'll just be on it. No, no, don't. Do you remember? So when I went back to work, I was struggling and trying to be a writer. And he, my father babysat my, mother, my daughter in the morning. Right. And my fa and my Divorceful. mother did in the afternoon because they were divorced. So it was like you know, it's a whole. It's great. It's a whole thing. It's a mini series. Yeah. But do you remember the story that about um, breakfast with Pop? Oh, he would yeah, make her amazing. So tell it, tell it. Breakfast. He was just super, super. Stop. Don't I do don't that. know where to be. He was, you're fine. He was super fun. So one breakfast could be a candy bar because why not? You know, sugar get your day started. And breakfast one time you were talking about the bagel. Yeah. I said I wanted. He said, you know, I brought bagels. How do you want your bagel? And I said, toasted with cream cheese. So he put cream cheese on the bagel and he put it in the toaster oven with the cream cheese on and toasted it. So it was like <laughs> completely soaked with, yeah. So maybe that, 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 that see that just, that kind of goes against my No, but it's adorable. Always learning, but he was hilarious. And it was like, you could never get him met. It's fine. Just stand normal. All right. Okay. She's she was yelling like, me in you front guys, of the people. She's, you would think like she's uh, going to hike the ball to me or something. I'm like, why are you crouching in front of me? Um, but anyway, yeah, I, he was just always fun. Everything with him was an adventure. Everything was never too serious to. You, you couldn't right. mess up with my grandma. Right, and you can't. And the truth is, you can't. Like, never let anybody tell you. To yeah, he didn't sweat the up. small stuff. In you can really totally mess up. He was uh, anyway. Well, we're going on and on. But he was but best. even the bagel thing, because I said to him, Dad, you know, you're supposed to like, you're not supposed to toast the bagel with the cream cheese with on the cream top. Cheese What's on the it? difference? I mean, you know, and then I was like, What's the difference? I you ate it. it. I ate it. Yeah, it was good. It's, if you do that, it just gets really liquidy, but it's still delicious. <laughs> <laughs> well, the culinary skill is got to least. All right, so that's so that's about today.